Hello. My name is Jim Cohn, and I'd like to welcome you to our investigative panel called Two Worlds, One Spirit. With me today are eight wonderful people, five poets, and three sign language interpreters. I'd like to introduce them to you now. On my left, your right, is Debbie Rennie. Her sign name is a D across the forward, across the forehead like this. Next to her is Mark Schmitz. This is his sign name, a C. Next to Mark, third, is Peter Cook, whose sign name is PC, like that. And on the end is Mr. Patrick Graybill, whose sign name is this, a P on the chest. Now, for this side on my right, your left, <laughs> is Clayton Valley, whose sign name is a V at the side of the mouth. Next is Donna Kachitis. Her sign name is a D on top of the hand, like so. Next to her, we have Kenny Lerner. His sign name is a K at the side of the head. If, if you'll notice, you, you might notice why his sign name is like that, if you look at his hair. And on the end is Ella Lenz, whose sign name is an E on the forehead. We're all getting together today from East and West, across America. We're coming together to share our feelings, ideas, and experiences about the relationship between a deaf poet and sign language interpreters or translators. <coughs> I'd like to begin our panel with a question. And I'd like to address it to each of you. What is your idea about the relationship between the poet and the sign language interpreter? All right. Uh, would anyone like to tackle that question first? Ella? OK. For myself, it depends on the audience. If, for example, my audience, I'm performing in front of a deaf audience, or an audience who is all proficient in sign language, I don't feel the interpreter is necessary. And if it's an ideal situation, I would like to feel very free in the, as, in, as in that one. I'd like to be able to match the interpreter as much as possible. That's a different story if I have to try to attempt that. In the past, I've recognized there's several different ways that I can do that, and I allow the interpreters to give in their input. Myself, as a poet, or a poet, when I work with the interpreter, I've noticed that, well, first of all, some poems are translatable. I translate, I write in English first and later translate into sign language, ASL. That means the interpreter is not responsible for the translation. They can follow my English version, unless I feel unsatisfied with my English version and ask for their feedback. But they are not, that is not as a poet. That I, that I am the translator then. Sometimes there are poems that I write um, in English so, and English ASL so that both match at the same time. And I try to adjust both languages to fit each other. And that means the interpreter doesn't really need to make adjustments, perhaps a few words to make it more appropriate, and that's all. Um, sometimes there's some poems I, I write in ASL first, and then later I'll translate into English for the voice person to be able to follow. But if the interpreter has, is very well skilled and proficient in poetry, then I would invite dialogue with that person so that they can help me translate it better, or let them create their own poem to match mine, if, as long as they check with me and ask me my feelings about how the poems. So there's three different ways that I work with interpreters uh, to make my poems translatable. It's very interesting for myself. That's how I work. I don't know about the other participants. 
All right. Uh, Peter Cook would like to talk now. Well, my idea in relationship with the interpreter and myself as a poet, as I perform and I stand, um, I deal with the uh, interpreter and see how they're doing and have them voice perfectly what I'm saying, but I think that's really impossible. I don't think that could ever happen in the real, real world. I think that uh, we have to have a really good rapport between the voice artist and the interpreter. I'm the poet, and basically, I feel that I need to match personalities with the person. We both have to be very open with each other. For example, Kenny works with me, and we work together forever in a day. We've had a very long relationship together, and he's been voicing for me for a very long time. I don't know about other people, but my experience is that we have a very strong relationship and, and artistic fusion. I feel that he's very free to use any words he wants, and I don't have... Well, for example, if I want a very specific word used, then I will let him know in no uncertain terms I want that word used. But if we're experimenting with sounds or sound effects or how to use it, that's really up to him. That's his department, and it's up to him to let me know. So it's the sharing of information with each other in an open dialogue. Often, really, he might not know the word that he wants to use, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll say, how did you say that? What do you want to do for that? And I'll think about it, and maybe then I'll give it to him. Other times, I'll be signing. And I'll say, you know, should I change this myself or what? And he'll say, no, 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 keep it just like that. I'll figure it out for you. I'll work on the language, the English part for you. So the creativity involved in the work is a, a process with both of us. It's not like we meet each other and we're strangers and I just asked him to translate it. That just doesn't happen, really. And the fusion that we get is very beautiful. I think it really helps with the understanding of the poem overall. <coughs> Okay, let's go to Debbie. I think you were next. My relationship with this, with an interpreter is that I've tended to, to work with the same one for the past three years, so she knows me very well. And I trust her, and I have a lot of confidence, and we've become a, very good friends now. Back in the beginning, I remember Jim was involved um, because he was a poet, and the person who was interpreting for me was not a poet at that time. And so we really had to discuss it in depth, and it became a beautiful process. Finally, as we got exposed more to each other and we had more and more lengthy discussions, I've really come to depend on her because my English skills are, are not up to the level that I would, I would like. I, I admit that freely. And so sometimes she writes something and, and, I, and will bring it to me and ask me what I think. Sometimes I'll ask her what I, I mean. What, what, I'll ask her what she means, and uh, we'll, we'll talk back and forth. You know, sometimes I'll have an abstract idea, and I'll have to describe more what, um, what I mean so that she can interpret better for me. Okay, Kenny. Let me see. Okay, just a couple of things. First of all, my goal is to follow the poet himself. And my goal as an interpreter is to attempt to to help the hearing audience understand Peter. And I want them to be able to understand for themselves. Uh, it's not from my speaking every word that Peter expresses to the audience. I don't want to do that. I'd rather allow silence to reign and let Peter express through his signs. Sometimes he signs in such a clear image that I try to shut myself up and allow the image to speak for itself. Sometimes I can establish something like uh, something in ASL, like you set up something in ASL, and later use that character again. It's always established in space. And I try to do the same in, with words. For example, if Peter is talking about um, a mountain, and he sets it up in space, and the poet is on the mountain, then I'll talk about the mountain, and then perhaps allow the audience to see the mountain. Let it see how it rises into space without me explaining or describing it. And I have a question for you. Suppose that you were an interpreter, or suppose you didn't know the interpreter, what would you do if you didn't know the interpreter intimately? Well, I've already experienced that out in Berkeley, California. I had never worked with a videotape in the past, and and I knew I was going to be getting married soon, and I was involved with a lot of plans, and I was going to need to be working with someone who I hadn't worked with before. 
Okay, so I needed to find a good interpreter. And when I got there, I practiced with this woman, and we worked back and forth. We had a lot of give and take. And I, I really wasn't sure what she was going to be saying, but but I felt oh, we had to develop our, our comfort level with each other. And we, I worked with her all day and all night. Um, okay, until about one in the morning, we had to get up at eight the next morning, and and I really felt a lot of comfort in her and confidence, and the audience laughed and and sat back and understood. So maybe that interpreter was one of my best translators, but I don't know. I haven't had time to ask her to put down everything that she said for me, but. It's really important for me to develop a very good rapport with the interpreter. They have to know who I am as a person. And if, if we feel comfortable with each other, that's the hardest thing. It's really, yeah, if things don't go well, I feel very uncomfortable and things don't go well for me. Okay, Mark? Oh, I think that what you, I've heard here has been very good to express what I feel too. Um, when you're using an interpreter with performing, either in theater or poetry, um, you have to have a team effort. But the, the poet does his own work, and when that's done and he wants to present it to a hearing person, then a hearing audience, then they need to work with an interpreter. There must be a lot of trust and respect between the two people working together. Trust and respect, I think, are the most important thing. What kind of respect? I'm curious what you mean by that word. Okay, as an interpreter, I must respect that poet and their work. It's not my work, it's theirs. I will be speaking English, and the English is mine. And I need to respect their work, and at the same time, they need to respect what I'm doing. And we need to establish a, a feeling of trust and and good communication with each other. I strongly agree with what Ella and Debbie said. Um, I'd like to hold that up for a moment and ask you more specifically. Um, when you say trust the English, do you mean for the voice interpreter uh, and translator? There are many levels of English. For example, first there's the voice. We, we have to trust the voice performance. I mean, we don't want the voice uh, interpreter to be taking the stage. Uh, there's, when, when you pick the words, there has to be trust that you'll pick the correct words. For, so, uh, you have to ask, talk with the person, make sure they do have that trust. Oh, I'll be happy to do that. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. I think that well, a lot of new interpreters get involved with poetry because it's a very enjoyable pursuit. I'm not quite sure if they're ready for that. Uh, they may not have as, as fluent a skill in ASL as they need. And maybe the translation task is above them, but they enjoy the process. And they enjoy having the link with the deaf community in that way and working with a deaf poet. Sometimes the results are good and sometimes rather mediocre, but I would guess that interpreters need to improve their skills better and they may need to become more skilled with both ASL and English. So they must be familiar with all the different forms of lecture, poetry, etc. For poetry itself, um, they need to understand poetry and they need to understand the use of the language and have skills in translating. <coughs> How can someone who's a deaf poet have real trust in a new interpreter, even though they have a lot of energy, they may not have the skill yet? Okay, uh, let's let Clayton speak for a moment. Well, we must have trust and understanding first. And when... <coughs> I may feel more confidence when I, I get 
support from my deaf audience. Oh, I need to establish a, a rapport with the audience. <coughs> and when I feel that they enjoy what I'm doing, I can go ahead and express myself well. That's how I feel. Well, what type of deaf audience? Deaf club um, or a, a deaf school for the deaf? It really depends on what type of audience you have to do and, and what level of understanding they possess. Well, I'm talking about a general type audience. Um, I need to feel that support coming from the audience. Actually, where is that? We need to find where our support comes from. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. When you say support, do you mean support from who? I mean, if there's someone behind me and, and everything is going well, I need, oh, I need to feel support for what I'm doing and then I can share it with another world. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask another question, maybe if we could hold that idea. Uh, when, when you say support... I really don't know. You mean, you mean the deaf community supporting you? Okay. Uh, Patrick. Well, I grew up in a school for the deaf and then I went to Gallaudet College, so I was not really familiar with using interpreters because I'd been in totally deaf environments. So in the beginning, it was a rather awkward process, and sometimes I still find it an awkward process to work with an interpreter. Something that I've learned is to discuss things with the interpreter, and, it, and it's quite a smooth process. It's really nice, open dialogue, and it's easy to communicate the different cultures to each other. And that really helps me trust the interpreter. If I feel like they have to ask me again and again, what do you mean, what do you mean, then it's really awkward, and that scares me a lot and alleviates that trust quite a bit. If there's a comfortability and a trust and a sense of respect, that has to come first, really, before the process can continue. Oh, I agree. When something is asked to me or somebody tells me something, it depends on that interpreter. I, I can tell if the person's not ready, if there's no sort of rapport to facilitate what I'm trying to get across. It depends on the interpreter. If there's somebody I feel very comfortable with and I know that their skill is adequate to match my style, then I know that they understand my culture and myself and that trust can be established quite readily. Donna, let's hear from you. I feel that um, what you do about trust and respect, but I feel those two are separate. My work as a translator is separate than my work, than Debbie's work as a poet. So that's very true. But do an interpreter translator, it's a very personal experience to work with a poet. And that's really from my heart. My heart must be involved in my work. When I work with Debbie and her message, or I work with another poet and their message, that's what I want to convey to the world. And I realize that takes so much time and effort to, um, that I must put into the translation. It's very important that I invest that energy. What it was I wanted to say? I'm sorry, it escaped me right now. Uh, do you mean that the issues, well, for example, um, how to phrase this? Are you saying the interpreter owns? the poet's work, uh, or do you mean oh, something else? No. I would not say owns. Oh, no, no, no. But it has, it does become very connected to me. It is a part of me. That's why I'm working on it. I work with Debbie's poem and I feel her work so intimately. I don't know if you saw her performance last night, but it's very powerful, very emotional. Issues are involved in her work, and that's I have to feel that I can support her work. If I feel um, that I'm, if I feel like, if like I did last night, if I felt that I wasn't particularly invested in her issue, then well, maybe maybe that would happen with Kenny. But if she's talking about something about the Jewish Holocaust or something, it might be more difficult. I have to feel supportive of what she says. Um, I would say that. Okay, um, Peter. Talk. It's interesting. Uh, what you were saying about the spiritual connection that you have to have with both people involved it makes me wonder, okay, suppose you have an all-deaf audience and you're performing to them and the deaf people are watching it and, and they're taking those images in and inside they're making their own interpretations as to the meaning and everybody has different interpretations for the work that they view and that's okay, but what I wonder is if I work with an interpreter 
and that interpreter picks all the words for me. I wonder if their use of words maybe is so powerful that it's forcing the meaning, their meaning, onto the audience, and perhaps that meaning is different than what the poet's expressing, or taking away the audience's right to their own interpretation. I know that you've worked with each other a long time, you and Debbie. I'm wondering if maybe you have, mm, maybe if there was a poem about Judaism or some Jewish issue, you think of something in New York City and, um, you know, something in Queens or, you know, some really strong Jewish neighborhood that might be there. If that was something that was happening and then somebody came to watch that and somebody in their mind had the image of a Polish Jewish person from California, it might it might force that view on the audience and really they might think, well, what right has that person to force their interpretation on me? It kind of becomes a sticky situation. But I remember, again, yesterday in my presentation, I said that Allen Ginsberg had said that when you translate it from language to language, you can transmit completely the images, but you can't really show the rhythm or the wit. What this means is that an exact interpretation of the poet through an interpreter is maybe not possible. And I think that the poets must accept that something's going to be lost something's going to be lost in that process and it's a risk that's involved it's inherent in the whole process and maybe the voice interpreter has to risk something too maybe the deaf poet loses something and it becomes something else you know for example you Kenny am I talking too long Jim well uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off in one minute but uh. all right okay for example Kenny Kenny Sometimes when I work with Kenny, I really want a specific image. I really want to convey that in that process. And he wants that image. He's trying to figure out how to voice it and match it. And we're in total contention. I'll say, I want it my way. I want it my way. I want it my way. And we're trying to, we're vying for the right words to use to convey my image. If he comes up with the right words to convey the image, great. But sometimes it becomes a whole new thing through our collaboration. Maybe it's better than what each of us thought separately to begin with. I want to add something. Okay. okay. Uh, we're going to hear from Patrick now. It's different. Okay, it's a little bit different in Kenny's case because he's not really an interpreter. And also, um, as for a voice artist, which is the title I guess you would apply to Kenny, it's different. An interpreter's job is to support, yes, and they're to sign the information and the image. The interpreter is supposed to convey that. And they're not supposed to influence or, or put their uh, convey their personality too much in the interpretation that they convey. They're there for support, mainly. So really, the internal essence, the spirit, should match between the interpreter and the poet and become one. And one is not supposed to override the other. There's not supposed to be any sort of power struggle going on. The essence of both is to be conveyed. It really is the two-world concept and one spirit. Related to that point, I would say that uh, I'd like to move ahead to what we're saying about two worlds, the separation between two worlds, but one spirit. So we're not saying that the two worlds come together and become one. I don't think we're saying that. But uh, it is related to that point. Uh, so I'd like you to address, as poets yourselves, what are the frustrations in working with interpreters? Uh, and then we'll address the same question to interpreters. What are the frustrations in working with the deaf poet? Patrick. Uh, last night I said that perhaps it might, or I was just recently saying it might be awkward to use interpreters sometimes. And when I create my poetry, um, you were saying before, Jim, and that when we were doing the Bird's Brain Society in the cellar, we were not to have any voice interpreters. And it was a very strong, liberating experience to do it that way. But remember I said in my story, the bartender in the cellar felt frustrated, wanted to know what was going on. So we brought in a voice interpreter specifically for the bartender to know what was happening. Now, I can't really remember my experience at that time because I wasn't involved. I sort of relegated the duty to somebody else. But more and more people were asking me to go and perform. And I asked Mark and I asked other interpreters to be included in my endeavors in that. And as these experiences gained and I collected more of them, I found that it was interesting to work with them 
I say, what words are you using? Which words did you choose to match? And I felt like I was kind of hitting a wall of frustration. I say, what's the word mean that you used? Or maybe you should have used another word. Oh, and then I had to see that their culture, their Indian culture, was somehow imposing itself in the English that they were using to match my message. Um, I had some experience working with the interpreter that I'm working with now for this conference, and it was wonderful because she was very supportive. There were some words. What was it? I wanted to use the word continually in one of my poems. Continually, and that was the image that I had chosen. Well, we were collaborating, and she said, really what I meant was continuously. Continuously. I thought, oh, what's the difference? She explained it to me, and I saw that there was a very subtle difference between the two. And I really enjoyed that and felt really comfortable to go ahead with that. I felt like that was the appropriate choice. That was the word, and it supported my work. I really enjoyed that. I've had frustrations with interpreters before being rather cold and saying, oh yes, that's fine, that's fine, but not giving any input to that, which is a very frustrating experience. I prefer that collaboration. Any other frustrations? Uh, Peter Cook? Um, in my work with con interpreters so far, when I sign and I expect the interpreter to find the words, whatever, I don't really become frustrated because I can use my creativity, and I'm very skilled at English, too. I can type up the words, give it to Kenny or whoever I'm working with, and see if they're okay. But one problem, because of my time, how I express myself, sometimes it limits the interpreter, and they don't have enough time to pick out the correct words. Um, for example, there's one... I don't know if I told you this before, Kenny, or not. Uh, maybe if it'll work in this example, we'll see. You know those ice cream trucks that go around in the summer? They're called good humor trucks, you know those? They have the name emblazoned on the side. Well, now I have a picture of an old cart with bells on the side. What would I call that? Maybe called pre-civilized good humor because it's an ancient relic of an early good humor truck. But there's really not enough time for all those words. Maybe the voice really doesn't have enough time. But those are the exact words that I want because it perfectly fits my image. But it's a frustration because of the time of how I express myself so quickly. So it's really neat. I like my image. It's neat. I like the words. It perfectly matches. But the time limit. So it's really important. That, that when Kenny and I work together, we try to change it and keep the time consideration in our minds while we're working with it. So that's one frustration, just the time involved. Okay, Mark. Why don't we just go right around here in a circle, okay? Okay, why not? I don't really experience much frustration with deaf poets. My frustration occurs with myself. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> I can just picture you beating yourself over the head. <laughs> Okay, well, no, it's an incredible responsibility to portray your work accurately. I want to do the best I possibly can because hearing people often don't have the opportunity to meet the deaf artist. Your art and your work, you have to do your own way. And sometimes we can take that over into translate it into spoken English. Sometimes it's very difficult to convey that appropriately. It's very, very hard work. So I'm not frustrated with you. No, I enjoy your work and I respect your work. It's me that I sometimes feel limited or, or weak in certain areas. So I try to make my work uh, come up and match yours and, and I really need enough time. Two weeks is not enough. Sometimes two years is not enough time to work on it. A wonderful translation sometimes takes two, three, four years, um, or even longer, as, as you experience. Um, so anyway, I'm very frustrated with myself. Uh, I'd like to know what kind of experience uh, you have um, he, I would like to talk about Mark a little bit. He's worked at interpreting services for quite a few years. For many years he's been involved in deaf theater in Texas. So that's a frustration for me because I know that he, well, he probably knows more than most interpreters do. So it means 
all that work that, that he really may want to do is impossible to do. So sometimes you get the feeling that you want to do it again, but you can't. You wish you could. Uh, you may feel you need to return to school to study more. You may need, feel a need to go back to school to get more tools to do a better job. Oh, wow, I feel that this question is directed toward me, but I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> My experience in the past in Texas was with a group, and there were a very strong group of, of ASL users. Similar to Patrick and, and Ella in the past, I was just a kid then. My experience there helped me to understand deaf culture. And now interpreters aren't learning that. They're, a lot are not really into deaf culture. They're learning from a book and they're learning in school and in associates programs. But I learned straight from the culture. Okay, I'm going right now into learning about anthropology and my my language in a liberal arts college. But I need to learn deaf culture from deaf people and by meeting them and understanding them better. But I strongly emphasize you must associate with the deaf. And if you if you don't, I don't see how you can possibly accurately translate between one language to another. Yeah. That's very true. I assume I'm next? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> My relationship with an interpreter has not been bad. I have not experienced a lot of frustration. I've been experienced in my limited English. I do. I've set up my own poems. But I've, I have had a few interpreters dispute how they wanted to interpret my poetry. Oh. I've had one interpreter say, oh, that was a beautiful, moving poem, and another one say, oh, that was so wonderful, it was so funny. And sometimes I like both of their opinions, but they're conflicting, and, and uh, they have two separate perspectives of my poetry. I'm not quite sure what to do. It's quite a problem for me, but I just kind of stay out of it and see what, what they come to as a resolution. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand what you mean. So you mean that two interpreters kind of talk about different meanings that your poetry has? Is that what you mean? Well, sometimes I agree with both, even though they're conflicting opinions. Like, like my poem last night, The Frog. If you've noticed that the frog looked kind of cute and funny and 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 uh can i can i go ahead and talk about this well but but donna thought that that was such a a, a beautiful expression and and thought it was choreographed very nicely and so i wanted to include both meanings within the poem You mean the internal meeting was different, or how you felt inside? You had to decide which one you wanted? No, I think that your meeting is the most important one. Well, within me, I had both feelings. So, I mean, it was an act both, equal division? You felt that funny and beautiful and, about it? And also comedy at the same time. So the voice interpreter might have a harder task on their hands. Because the frog looks kind of funny. But it's also sort of a beautiful approach, and and both are within one, and so that's a really different, difficult thing to express and interpret. So I really struggle with that myself too, and I was frustrated. I was couldn't quite figure out how to to combine them, and so we talked about it a bit. May I say something now? Yes, Donna. When the three of us were working on I thought it went really smooth because while you were performing, you wanted to play, you wanted to have fun with it. For kids, you were performing, so that's when I came up with a translation. But when you performed it for adults, you emphasized the more fluid, the fluidity of the poem, the beauty of the poem. So I agree with, with that translation in the end. There are two different ways I had to find. There are two different answers 
for that poem. Yep, that one poem. Oh, the rest were fine, and we didn't really have many arguments, but oh, that one caused a, a lot of problems because there were two meanings within it. There was both the humorous approach and beauty was expressed at the same time. And also, that poem. That poem last night was, was produced for an audience who saw the humor in your own face as you performed it. And my voice described the beauty of your movements. And so the audience got both. It was successful from both of you, from your own expression and from my voicing. So that was interesting. Okay, uh, do we have a question from the audience? <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Could we wait until we have heard from all the participants? So please hold your questions. Okay, thanks. Okay, could we move on now, Kenny? I was in the middle of this triangle of discussion about Debbie's poem with the fry. Can I jump in now? Yes, uh, we were discu discussing uh, frustrations about working with deaf poets or hearing interpreters. Um, so I thought we needed to move on. Clayton. I have several different frustrations. Well, actually three. When I work and create my poetry and have it done and I'm satisfied with it, then I've, in the past, I brought in an interpreter and tried to work with him. And I felt that they were really influencing my work and that I, it was really hard for me to develop trust with them. So I, I felt more of a struggle. Maybe the work was a little bit my work is, tends to be a little bit different, and uh, maybe, maybe um, you can feel that you can figure out a match. So, if one reads it first, and then, oh. You can have written poetry, and when I hand that out, then you can read it first, and then you have the visual experience. And that's, and that's different because you see the concept emerging, and then hopefully they match, and that's how I prefer to work. When I've traveled, and an interpreter has been there to voice for my presentations, not, I'm not speaking about performances right now. After a performance is finished, like when I'm explaining my poetry or, or when I have given it out in a written form, it's a lot less frustrating for me. I have a question. Okay, Ella. When you give out papers, who is written by the paper? Do you translate it yourself or does another interpreter or another translator poet work on your English translations? Okay. I, I didn't get a chance to say that yet. Okay, in the past. I haven't been satisfied with various translations. They've tried to write poetry to match my poetry, but their words might express a slightly different concept, and it's they don't really fit. The written um, expression that I've recently given out is is kind of a mixture of poetry and prose. And when I, I saw that, and I, I started working with this person, I felt that I, I really liked what they did. They broke the rules, and and they they did some switching without the language, and I was very happy with what I found. I'd like to add something to that. I'd like to comment okay. about what you just said. One thing neat about uh, the writing that I saw yesterday, that performance, I got the sheet of paper and read it, and there was the poem all written out, and it made me think. I'd read it first, and then he would sign it. But, no, I wouldn't say that it was a poem when I read it, but what I liked was the writing structure. I'd like to call it like classified English in a way. Because it had broken sentences in places, but each word itself showed one of the images that he was conveying in his signs. So I thought that was a really neat, a really neat way to do that, because the word Sometimes, the, by the vagueness of English sentence, you don't know what exactly it means. But the way that was written down, each image was specifically conveyed in a word, I felt. Let me give you an example. Uh, 
tall, with a very tall column. You see this facial expression with the puffed out cheeks? Yeah, when someone has, has found uh, words to express that, I, I like that. someone a, a centuries old column and and that was exactly what I meant it had it had not been touched and it had been standing there for a long time and I really like the fact that they found words that match my expression okay Donna my frustration working with a deaf poet and from my experience my woman, well, the deaf poet I've worked with mostly is Debbie, and she's an angel. She should wear a halo, because always before the performance, she always gives me the videotape, and I have time. She lets me work and have time with the videotape. Plenty of time before the actual performance. And personally, I really like to watch the video again and again and again. Watch the poem until I understand it in my mind and in my heart. And then I can fully comprehend it and start to think about the English translation after I comprehend it from within. So I think she's the perfect poet, and I have no complaints. Thank you. What if you had to work with another dry deaf poet? Why don't you try working with that? I like mine. Thank you very much. OK, hold on. Well, right I don't here. have any frustrations with Kenny, but I do have frustrations with other interpreters criticizing Kenny or criticizing Donna. You mean other interpreters criticizing my work? Um, people who hear the voice. I don't really believe that the frustrations are valid, but you know, in the outside community. I'm talking about working with a poet. With language itself, oh, sometimes I have difficulty with that, trying to find images, sentences to convey the images exactly in English. That sometimes does occur, but it seems to me that it's only, it's, I, there's always a possibility of finding a way, there's a possibility of finding something to resolve the problem. Because that, I don't translate uh, as a into a poem exactly I try to use the way I speak uh, to indicate and allow Debbie's own body gestures to indicate also what she intends so I feel I'm very fortunate in that way to allow her to speak for herself well maybe one frustration <coughs> could be well maybe naturally, naturally one frustration would be timing uh, well, for me, because Debbie, Debbie's a doll. <laughs> That's the reason for me. I understand what you're saying, but, but, but maybe in the past, when we just began working together, she wasn't always giving me her uh, materials before time, um, and, and enough time. I think it's very important to have plenty of time to w wait to get the information, the materials way ahead of time. And so in that way, I haven't been frustrated with that aspect of it. I was wondering, why is that important? I mean, I, I'm just wondering why is that so important for you? Well, it's very important because my philosophy is that um, I have to watch the video again and again to see the poem repeatedly so that I can fully understand everything, all the subtleties that Debbie intends. And when I comprehend those fully, I understand the meaning within the core of myself. I can begin to express it into English words and only with that amount of time. That's the reason time is important to me. And that requires time to watch it again and again. And then to begin to think about the English requires even more time. So. For those reasons, time is a, a, a crucial. I'd like to add something? Okay, Patrick. A uh, new frustration seems to be popping up now as you watch it again and again and again because you know Debbie's work and you work with her. Hey, Patrick, I'm something I watched some of it, and some of it I really didn't understand at all. And maybe you did because you'd seen it again and again. I watched and I felt frustrated. I only saw it once, only had one opportunity. Then I'm quite lucky, aren't I? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go to Clayton. Okay, I'd like to add to something that he said. Um, to see. <laughs> oh. What was that? Okay, the good form is more important. There's so many things I want to say right now, but everything's escaped from my mind at the last minute, the crucial moment. Okay, I feel it's very important to have a lot of time. 
um, the interpreter is a has to see the poem again and again and again to try to express uh, uh, the poem in the same way that the poet intends to try to establish for the hearing audience. Um, and the hearing audience also might need to see it again and again. But the problem is it's very, very frustrating if, for example, working with Peter Cook, if he just gets an idea at the, at the night before the performance, it's a wonderful idea, and he begins to create like mad, and he asks me, how do you say something? Um, and using um, character shifts, or he's, he's using classifiers back and forth to show different perspectives at the same time rapidly shifting. How am I going to translate that? How am I going to do that in that amount of time? And I need time to consider it and to mull it over. But I'm very fortunate because we worked together for such a long time and that Peter is finally beginning to figure out a way to get over it. Not always does he, is he good about, about limiting himself to allow me to have enough time, but he's beginning. Yeah, yeah. I think that your poem, is very, for poetry, is very, very beautiful. It works perfectly. And for me, the pictures are very clear. And for me, the poetry is always there for you. Sometimes when Peter and I work together, I, we begin to have a poem and I begin to translate it. And he creates a poem. At first, I never tried to create a poem myself. For example, I try to create images sometimes with my English to show the images that the poet is, is expressing. But I try to let the audience figure it out for themselves and laugh for themselves. I don't feel like they always need the English word. Like if I can establish a picture and the poet establishes a picture, it works perfectly. It works perfectly. And that's why I feel your work is so powerful. It's very imagery bound. And as an interpreter, if you work as, as an artist, as an, with an interpreter artist, with a black combination of your of your talents, then you do have then you do have a person who fits you very well. I feel that the hearing audience will understand better if they read your poems first, understand that, and then watch you. Even if they don't understand sign language, they can see your gestures and your facial expressions and your and movements. I feel your work is translatable. I'm not talking about frustrations. Darn, I'm not sticking to the point. OK, let's talk about the frustrations but, but you've got now, then. we're talking about the level of frustration here, OK? Uh, I'm discussing. I'm frustrated about not being able to discuss frustration. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about oh. Ella. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> now let's uh, speak to Ella about frustrations. OK, I have two frustrations, but I hope I remember them both. What are they now? Okay, first is, sometimes, I don't really know if it's called a frustration, but sometimes I feel like, darn it. I've noticed that, you know, I've come up with this poem in sign language, I feel that it's great, and sometimes I'm not completely satisfied with the poem, I'm not 100%, but I feel like it's good enough for now, and I'll leave it frozen in the way it is, and perhaps I don't want to fuss with it anymore at the moment. And then I give it to the interpreter, after I've created the poem, I have it written down as the way I want it, I've memorized it, and I, don't, I, you know, I can't read it from the page. I have to memorize it and know the way I'm going to perform it. And the uh, interpreter watches the poem and works on the translated version. And then we begin to discuss it. And I see, oh, the interpreter has some good lines. And maybe the deaf audience will not be aware of those lines because they cannot hear when the interpreter is speaking. So perhaps the hearing audience is benefiting more from my work because of the translated version, so I don't like that. So then I begin to change my poem to adapt it to what the translator has added so that the deaf people don't miss anything. And I can't follow that exactly, of course, but it does influence my work. The other frustration is time. You say you must get the work before, ahead of time, and I understand your feelings. But sometimes, for example, this conference, it's been very frustrating. I'll be openly um, honest with that, because my interpreter wanted this before time. She said that she wanted the work ahead of time, and I was very, very busy. I have my own life, you know? I have my own things to do. And you're all very excited about the conference, but I wasn't able to focus on that. I had so many other priorities, and time was a, was a very limiting factor. I didn't know which poems I was going to use. My interpreter started to call me and say, well, what's going on? Are you? I haven't gotten your poems yet. I need to have, start working on the English translation. And I said, well, I haven't sent the English. I do have the English translation. I started to feel like the interpreter was taking over. Uh, oh, taking over my per show. And I thought, she doesn't have to worry about it. It's my performance. You, it's not your trouble. 
So I felt like it was my responsibility. If the interpreter uh, makes errors, it's not her fault because she's done. I've done the best I can. So I felt that she didn't have to worry about it. And the hearing people. I didn't know what the hearing people would or would not get, but I felt like I'm doing this as a deaf poetry conference, so it's for people who are skilled at sign language or for people who are, use, are deaf and use sign language as their natu a native language. And I thought if people who don't know sign language want to come, that's fine. Maybe they can get what they can, but it's, they're not going to be able to get the 100%. So I felt like here, for the interpreters to work so much for just a few people mm -hmm. who don't know any sign language, what's what's the point? I didn't really understand why they should work so hard and, and worry so much about it and worry so much about the interpreters when really it's my show and I need to focus on it. But on the other hand, I realized that if the, the, per, the <laughs> interpreters focus and, 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 and commitment to their work, it makes me work harder. So in that way, it's better. But I felt a little odd about it. I felt, why is the interpreter worried so much? What's their perspective? I had the idea that this was a lousy interpreter interpreted that she was worried so much about my work. So mm -hmm. for that reason, mm -hmm. I didn't understand this. It's my show. This performance is my show. And again and again, um, uh, there's another issue with the interpreter's role. I thought, hey, I'm doing a good job. Uh, the interpreter, and I felt like I didn't have to worry about what the interpreter's going to say. Now I'm going to realize, wow, there's something new to, for me to think about. And so I took that into consideration now. I don't know if I can separate myself from the poet translator or if I can start to work with them. I found like that's a very interesting issue that you're bringing up here and I'm becoming to, beginning to face that. I think it's really good for me to see that and start to realize that there are interesting issues involved here. So the interpreter is doing a good work on several of the poems that she had the opportunity to and um, I've enjoyed that. But I, if she could have had two or three works before to work on it, would have been weeks before it would have been good. So there's many issues to consider. Okay, well, we have to consider time here. It is running out, which is frustrating. Uh, maybe if you could each, in one, give me one sentence reply. Uh, I'd like to ask a question now to poets. Who are you, who do you consider yourself to be working for? What I mean is, and this is also important for interpreters as a professional group, and as ind individuals. Uh, and also your fellow human beings uh, should understand your position. I mean, uh, is this poetry only for deaf culture, which is fine? Uh, I don't feel that would be a mistake. Uh, or is it for all human beings, hearing and deaf? White, black, Jewish, handicapped, whatever. I think this is an important question. And in fact, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, for for who you, who I'd like to ask, who is your poetry for? <coughs> Well, of course, it's for myself. As a deaf person, I want to convey these images and ex convey my experiences and then get these out to the whole community to see. Sometimes I must confess to some internal frustration, and then once I let it out, I feel so much better about myself. It's good to let it out. Because I is, I'm a committed artist, I perform for any audiences who's interested in seeing my work. And that's the sum total of it, deaf, hearing, whoever. I'm interested, if they want to come and watch me and they want to see my work, then fine, whoever they are. If they don't like it, that's fine too. Hearing, deaf, blind, it doesn't matter. They come to see my work and appreciate it. And it's really, I, it's their support that I'm interested in. Uh, one thing, maybe you could share a story that recently happened to you. Uh, do you remember it was, you were really struck well, when you saw two people? Yeah, it's interesting. You know that often in the community, um, sometimes I'm very frustrated with the deaf community. A person becomes successful and popular, and then everybody starts stabbing them in the back, you know, and starts cutting them up behind their back. Now, because I learned sign language only seven years ago, I grew up as a primarily oral person. As I became more and more fascinated with deafness, sign language, culture, I thought it's great. I wanted to be involved with that and become, popularize it. Well, I noticed two deaf people on a poster, and it's an advertisement. People, two deaf people saw my poster, and they said, Peter Cook, who's he? What's that? Oh, he's this oral guy. 
he's this oral guy, and that really, that really perturbs me. But what it means exactly, I don't know, you know. I want the people to, de deaf people to support my period, my, my work period. Oh, this is an emotional one. Really, my work is for me, and it's very important for me. Many times I, I have something that, that hits home and, and, oh, I, I need to share my feelings, for example, about Africa. And I write this poem for me, but also, it's very important for me to share my strong feelings with the world because I'd like to teach the world to become a more peaceful place. Really, it's up to the audience to come if they're interested. But I've experienced deaf audiences with hearing people in them in California. I was very concerned because I know deaf people can be extremely blunt, they're famous for that, and I was real concerned that they might think that what I had to say was not important or inappropriate, but they really applauded my work. I was very surprised and very pleased that they supported me, and that meant a lot to me, more than someone saying, oh, that, that's beautiful or that looks nice, you know. I, I really want this sharing and this give and take with the audience it's very precious to me, and that's really what's important. And that's the reason this is a very emotional topic for me. Okay, Clayton. I agree with Patrick. I write this for me, and I like to share it, but I like to focus on the deaf audience. Because there's no deaf literature in the schools. There's nothing shared for the, for the deaf. And I'd like to see that grow. I, I admit that I, f I focus on the growth of deaf, deaf expression, and, and that makes me feel very pleased that that happens. How do you feel about the hearing audiences? When you present your poems for hearing audiences, you make it accessible for hearing too, right? Yeah, I'm happy to share what I feel with hearing audiences, but I can't focus on the hearing. I need to focus on, on the deaf expressing themselves first. Hello, Kayla. Again, my poems are all so different. And um, sometimes I tell, sometimes I write in English first and translate to ASL. Sometimes, you know, there's three different modes I work in. And some poems I read for myself. I just want to express something that has inspired me. Or uh, some, I wrote one poem called I Music about the, how the telephone wires um, inspire me and think of, make me think of music. And that's just a poem I want to share. I can't really, I can't really label it. Like, I just want, I can't keep it to myself. I'd like to show it. And sometimes I want to show for, hear, for hearing and deaf people on the English page. But it's sometimes also I feel like I can't translate my work. It's too difficult. And I allow another person to try to sign it for me. And that gives me ideas. And I take their ideas. And that helps me to change my own work and just and to stay a sow. Because I really love a poem. And, and I think people will like it too and enjoy it. But it's not particularly striking. In another way, some kinds of poems are just um, a part of my life, or uh, like my sister, I do it for life. Um, for example, my sister and brother-in-law's wedding, you know, I couldn't write, write any poem. I wanted to create my own poem. I wanted to create a poem and not take it from English and translate it. And I wrote a poem specifically for their wedding. And most of the people who went to that wedding were deaf. You know, even the priest was deaf, the mother and father were deaf. There are only a few grandparents who were hearing, and that's all. Most of the audience, almost all of it, them were deaf, and they loved it so much. So that was written very much for the deaf audience, and I felt very good about that. Some poems, in the past, my ASL poems are strongly related to my deafness, to deaf themes. And I found that I really tend to focus on deaf themes. And I realized that in the past, 
Be recently, I would before this, I would play with language and signs and hand shapes. But recently, for the last seven poems I've written, are all related to deaf themes and deaf politics. So I think it's specifically for a deaf audience. Uh, people who ask me for poems to, for Celebration 1984 or something, I'll have to come up with something specifically for a celebration for a specific event. I haven't had the opportunity to create for my own self. That's the situation I've been in recently. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you. Uh, let me ask. Well, before we start with questions from the audience, I would like for you to know that we have two interpreters on either end of the stage, and it's very important that you realize those interpreters need to see you, okay? So please stand if you have a question to ask. First, raise your hand, please. Then when you're recognized, stand up and ask away. Okay. All right, we have a question. Yes. Could you come down? You want me to come down there? Okay. Can you see me all right? Um, a little bit further, okay. A little more, a little more. Okay, I have a question. I am deaf myself. I was raised and I went to a residential school. And then um, that influenced me to concentrate on English. English, always English. And then the deaf poetry convention here, you have ASL and I feel now more free. I feel this is wonderful, I'm free. English can go right out the window. And now as you discuss these things and I watch you and I see your opinions and all, and hearing people speak about English and that kind of thing, I have a question for those who are deaf those who are poets. Do you want to work with an interpreter? Do you feel committed to the hearing audience? Okay, did you all understand that question? Okay. All right, Patrick. I don't feel a particular commitment or responsibility or a duty to work with interpreters, I feel this obligation to myself. That's why I picked a good opportunity, a good interpreter to work with myself, that so I could trust their skill, because I feel this duty to satisfy my own. Okay, self. may I continue you, this question? The duty is to yourself, that's fine. What I'm trying to say is, I am deaf. I want to come here and observe. I want to see you be free you know, to sign freely. Do you really feel free? Now you mean? Do That's you know? my question. Oh, yes. Yes? Yes. With an interpreter, are you free? Oh, oh, now I understand your point. Okay. You mean like in the back of my mind, do I always have this interpreter infringing themselves upon me? No. I would say no. Before that was the case. And uh, now I realize uh -huh. it's, it's okay. their problem. Mm -hmm. It's okay. different. Okay, Ella. I would say fully free if I have an interpreter voicing for me. No, not completely, because my poetry, I use such strong ASL, and it's very difficult for the interpreter to match me and to follow. And they can't always follow me. Some, some interpreters can and some can't. Uh, sometimes I forget my lines because it's concerning me, and the interpreter can cover up. And I feel, oh, shit, the interpreter knows what's going on, and I don't. But um, if the interpreter knows, um, sometimes the interpreter knows sign language really well, I can't freeze my poetry in the same way over and over again. If the interpreter wasn't there, I would feel like I could eliminate something or add something at the last minute and adjust my, my poems yes, more. Yes, but, but I, feel I, I think there's a misunderstanding. Them. Perhaps I don't understand. You mean right now, right here? Uh, um, um, okay. I have many questions in one, you know. It's a loaded question. But my frustration is that I am deaf. Why do the hearing people have to be in the... Why, why are they hearing? Hearing, hearing, hearing. You know, it's deaf, it's deaf culture, that's the point. How can we have our own culture if we have hearing people included and in, uh, playing around and involved with our deaf culture? Deaf people should be free to choose and express what they want to express. And, you know, you know, I think that's just one of many questions, really. Oh, okay, we seem to have a lot of responses. All right, Clayton. Okay, I understand your point. We have two different situations here. One situation is that we could have all deaf in, in an area, and, or we could have a deaf and hearing mix. That's a big difference. There's a lot more freedom when it's only deaf people in the audience, and 
and I'm being deaf, and that's your point, isn't it? There's a lot more freedom. For example, yesterday, when those of us who are deaf on the piano got together and talked in depth about what we felt about all this, oh, it was such an intense sharing. Now I have to feel like yes, it's, it's, yes, it's yeah. less in-depth that, sharing. That, that, that's what bothers me. That really bothers me. See, now you feel less. That bothers me. Okay, let's go to Patrick again. I think that here, I feel that what the, the struggle is that we're, we're really pressed for time as part of it, and we have these cameras blazing in our faces, and and we're talking about the two different cultures, the cross-cultural way, and and it's and it's easy to have those sort of limitations on the way that we're communicating now. And also, we're having to, to take turns, and we're not really being able to have a fast sort of open dialogue the way we did yesterday, where we could just throw it in whenever we wanted to. And I, I think that's part of the frustration you're experiencing. <coughs> okay, Debbie. Right now, we're on stage, and we're signing very clearly, because I want everyone in the audience to see what I mean. But. But I'm such a messy signer, and, and I just let everything all come out all at once when I'm in a small group of, of deaf people sharing. With my poetry, I feel very comfortable, and when an interpreter comes in, they need to match me, and that's very important. It's extremely important that they express exactly what I do. So see, so what you were saying, you were standing very clear, and you have the person match and interact with you. If I have anyone who's hearing in the audience, I, I've, oh, I have to tell you, if there are more hearing that's people true. in the audience, there's more money for me in it. Mm -hmm. So I have to make mm -hmm. a living, and I'm a freelance mm -hmm. performer. Yes. I'm, I'm an itinerant performer, and I travel to a variety of places, and mm -hmm. I need to make money, mm -hmm. so I need to depend on an interpreter. But I much prefer having an all-deaf group to work with and using all ASL and not needing to use any lip movement just so that we can have deaf power and, and, and feel a communion and use ASL. Instead of feeling like I'm in an English class talking about ASL poetry, <laughs> Sorry about that. I've, I've felt that ASL was considered a bad language, and the deaf are very, very frustrated about this issue, and I've struggled and struggled over English. It's very sad. So I feel that ASL is very important to me, and it, it seems that it's, it's diminishing in use, much similar to the American Indian culture. Okay. Oh, Mark? <laughs> I know this question was directed toward the deaf, but I'd like to... Oh, I like to Clayton's idea that deaf poetry is for the deafs primarily. And I don't want to ruin the culture, but I think it's beautiful. And I can help you share the beauty in your own culture. It's the same as any other language, Japanese or French. They have their own poetry that's written. And sometimes I see that and see how beautifully it's written. And why can't we share that with the rest of the world? So I wish for your poetry to not be ruined by people who speak English. Um, but I would, like, I would like to see you all develop it and have it untouched by people who use English and then be able to translate it so that we can share it, but I don't want to influence it. Okay, the final statement before I leave. I support what you have said about yourself first, and then the deaf group, and, and the deaf community, and then the others in the world. We have to do for ourselves first before we share with the others. Can I say okay, something Patrick. to that? His statement really helps me uh, think of something that hadn't really been stated yet. This National Deaf Poetry Conference, the aim of this is to deaf people, and my other goal is for myself. 
I want this conference to be a sharing experience. We haven't really done as much with that yet. That's that's sort of been missing thus far. The sharing amongst each other. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Listen. Oh, we have time maybe for one more question from the audience. I'm sorry about that. Perhaps afterwards we could entertain more individual questions. Meaning, how can the interpreter keep the intent in the translation? You know, the words to describe space and locations. Okay. <coughs> All right, Peter. I can give you a little bit of an idea. I'll answer it with a question for you. How can we deaf people translate a hearing poem that, with rhythm? How do we show that rhythm in rhyme and sign language? It's kind of the same idea, in my opinion. I think uh, an interpreter can't do exact translation, not complete. Maybe the movement, like showing the affect on the face very easily, but the expression changing as they near something, the apprehension. I did a lot. Which I did this one classifier, but with my face, I added so much. Of what was I thinking in the back of my mind with this attitude of my body? Now, how can you say all that completely? What, what goes on? How would you do that? How would you do that, Kenny? Oh, what do you mean? Like, I would say that you're walking away, and I try, you're trying to show that someone's walking ahead of you. Is that what you mean? But what's my emotional content behind that? You notice that I had other things involved other than that classifier I was using. What was I thinking? What's in the back of my mind? I used spatial use and expression in several elements. Okay. In the poem right now, there's all, always before and after. There's a post and pre before the poem. And we've already established where the space is happening, where things are happening into space, and then we can enter the space or leave it. So you, when you walk through, I don't really have to try to express that because it's already there visually. It's already yeah. there, apparent. Yeah. Okay. The audience can see that, too. The Me and the too. interpreter doesn't have to say anything? I Hands off? Up. That way. And that way, I think you're right. It cannot be translated. I think you're right. Form cannot be translated. But it can be established for the hearing audience visually by the expression that you use, by the movement that you use. And I think I really believe that. You can. I think we can stop trying because that's the reason I would ask you how you would do something. I don't have to do it because your expression and movement just speaks for itself. Okay. Uh, let me ask this, get, get clear on this. Uh, we have two different levels of things happening again. There's the voice interpreter and their response to facial expression, okay? And if the body language shows a feeling, for example, Allen Ginsberg is a skilled user of expre facial expression. And he feels facial expression is the best way of expressing yourself. So in your work, if you find a word, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, Peter, for, for Kenny right okay. now. If a person is frustrated with the translating, I think it is possible, but in my opinion, it won't. The effort, I, I don't know. I think that probably it's going to be a weak effort. A really, really skilled adept translation. I don't know. I, I really doubt that it's possible to happen, to have an exact across-the-board translation of it. Well, I don't know about that, because if in the, play, the space, in a poem, the space must be established first. It must be established correctly and clearly. And if the space is established, for example, you say, suppose we have, suppose you have a poem related to a store, or shopping, and if you're talking about um, establishing a market someplace, and a man is shop doing some shopping, and the, and the image is already there, and I can follow what Peter has established in the space, and if things are set up in different places, I can use the words to indicate that. And later, Peter can run through those places and have a person walk through the space, and since I've already established it with words, I don't have to say it again. I don't have... I don't have to use the exact same words later, or perhaps I could give cues later, one word for the hearing audience to catch on. Oh, yes, that's the place, again, to follow and connect with each space again as the, as the poet goes through the space. Okay, so we'll give Clayton the last word or sign as I suggest word. that the next time the two of you try, because someone doesn't know sign language or has never seen it, 
and the tour you perform in front of them, ask them what that person thinks. We did that, right, we did that uh, a couple of days ago. Um, the reporter came to our house to watch us do a rehearsal for the for my poetry performance. Now, he didn't know any sign language at all. So, uh, how did you feel about that situation, how we handled it? I understood the, he understood the process, but some parts I think he didn't understand completely. Which part? What are you, what are you talking about? Uh, about using space? Is that... And the movement, right? No, no. I think it, when it became abstract, I didn't fit well enough with you, so therefore I have to work more and focus on trying to translate that section of the poem's right. Clayton's right. It's really important to have a hearing person um, who doesn't understand sign language to have their feedback for the translations. Okay. I'm sorry, but I guess our time has run out. <laughs>